Now, this is an interesting one. The USA, someone said they heard on John Stewart's podcast that the USA had good social programs until 1964. And after that, they went away because it didn't want to include black people. That is not exactly true, but there is a, a huge amount of truth in that. And let's talk about that. All right, let's just talk about that. So, so there really was no welfare state to speak of in the United States until Roosevelt. There was a little bit of one. Um, the very beginnings of the welfare state came during the U.S. Civil War. Actually, I learned about this in college. I took government bureaucracy. The very beginnings of the welfare state in the United States started during the U.S. Civil War because there were all these small farmers in the United States and Abraham Lincoln needed them to go and fight the South. And if you're a small farmer, uh, you're not very likely to join the military. Why? Who's going to take care of your wife and kids if you die? Right? I mean, you know, they, they were able to recruit a lot of young unmarried men. But if you're married and you're a small farmer, you know, you're fucked. I mean, if you get shot, your wife and kids are going to be destitute for the rest of their life. And so there were a lot of small farmers that said, hey, I've got an obligation to my family. I've got an obligation to my country also, but my wife and kids are a little closer to me and I don't want to go die. Uh, you know, I don't want to get my head shot off and my wife and kids then be homeless. And so Abraham Lincoln realized this was a recruiting problem for the U.S. military. So they came up with a, an act, basically, that widows and orphans, uh, as a result of, of war, if, if the father of your family died in the Civil War, you would get a pension. And that was like the first welfare program they ever had. And it, were, it did wonders. A lot of farmers uh, signed up and were willing to join the military, understanding that if they got killed, um, you know, if they got killed, their wife and kids would be taken care of. But there really wasn't much of a welfare state beyond that. Uh, Thomas Paine, one of the founders of the country, one of the agitators of the American Revolution, he wrote a book advocating for a guaranteed minimum income. Uh, you know, that would be that would exist. Basically, every community would pay a certain tax and that tax would be used to, to subsidize the minimum income to all citizens. But he was not listened to. He was considered to be very a far left radical. He was a supporter of the French Revolution. He was a, a supporter of the Haitian Revolution. And he was not really listened to. Um, but it was really with Roosevelt. You had the very beginning of the welfare state. Right. Roosevelt, you know, 1936, he was facing almost all of Wall Street wanted him out. Right. The uh, the big corporations wanted him out. The National Association of Manufacturers wanted him out. Uh, Henry Morgan wanted him out. Henry Ford wanted him out. But the Rockefellers supported Roosevelt. And so Roosevelt, in order to stay in office and in order to have the United States not align with the Nazis during World War II, Roosevelt took a, a swing to the left and he entered an alliance with the labor unions and with the Soviet Union. Right. He basically said he recognized the Soviet Union. In 1935, I believe, the USA recognized and established diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. Um, and then Roosevelt, um, you know, and after the strike wave of 1934, right, you have to remember 1934, there were three major cities in the United States that were shut down by communist led strikes. Uh, Toledo, Ohio, communists led the uh, the auto light strike and members of something called the American Workers Party and members of the Communist Party shut down Toledo, Ohio. And then in Minneapolis, the Trotskyite communists of the Teamsters Union, they shut down Minneapolis with the Teamsters strike of 1934. And then in San Francisco, the Communist Party, Sam Darcy, Samuel Darcy and um, and uh, Harry Bridges and other people, they shut down San Francisco, the great the great, you know, dock workers strike of 1934 in San Francisco. So you had three different cities shut down by communist led strikes in the south. Uh, the communists were organizing sharecroppers unions. Um, you also had textile workers on strike. Um, it was just a summer of unrest. 1934 was a summer that shook the world. I mean, this this country was was having a working class rebellion in, in every corner of the country. Minneapolis was having a working class rebellion. California was having a working class rebellion. Ohio was having a working class rebellion. Uh, you know, the South, South Carolina, the National Guard is sent out to fight the communist led sharecroppers. They're having a rebellion all over America. Communists are are on the march, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are becoming sympathetic to communism. And so Roosevelt is facing, you know, there was an attempted military coup against him in 1934 that wanted to set up a fascist dictatorship. Uh, you know, Henry Ford is openly talking about, you know, fascism, the leaders of the American Legion, which is a veterans organization. They're talking about setting up a, a, a Mussolini style dictatorship in Washington. 
So Roosevelt is facing all this opposition um, and his backers, his financial backers, because he's longtime old money New York or the Rockefellers, the oil bankers, the Rockefellers, but his enemies, they're the factory owners. Roosevelt entered a strategic alliance with the Rockefellers and supported the labor movement and supported labor unions. And so Roosevelt was reelected in 1936. It was a, an overwhelming victory, even though it seemed like all of Wall Street was against him. You know, the CIO supported him. The Communist Party, they ran their candidate for president, Earl Browder. Uh, but Earl Browder in the 1936 election basically said, don't vote for me. I'm just running to make a political statement. Vote for Roosevelt. Uh, the campaign slogan of the Communist Party was democracy or fascism. Roosevelt was democracy. Roosevelt's enemies were fascism. And Roosevelt won the 1936 elections. So immediately, the factory owners across the United States started laying workers off, basically, in protest. And it was more or less a strike by the capitalists. They didn't want to pay Roosevelt's taxes. They didn't want to pay taxes to pay for things like Social Security. And they didn't want to pay for Ro Roosevelt's Works Progress Administration. So the capitalists started laying workers off from their jobs to say, oh, well, you voted for Roosevelt. And this is similar to what they do in Venezuela. You know, in Venezuela, you know, they would do stuff like this. When Hugo Chavez would win an election, all the capitalists would say, all right, we're going to have mass layoffs. Oh, look, you voted for this. This is what happens. This is what they do. So, so the capitalists are laying workers off. So then 1937, you had the beginning of the sit-down strike wave. And it started in Akron, Ohio, uh, with the rubber workers. They occupied their factory. And then it spread to Flint, Michigan, where the auto workers in Flint, Michigan occupied their factory. And pretty soon, all across the United States, workers were occupying their factories. They weren't just going on strike. They were taking over and refusing to leave their places of employment. And they would barricade the doors shut, and the police would come and kick them out, and they would fight the police, and there'd be thousands of people gathered outside to support them. And um, it was basically, it was, you know, workplace occupations. And Roosevelt sent the military to Flint, Michigan to support the strikers. People saw the military walk in and they thought, all right, it's going to be the military is going to drive out the strikers. And then everyone was blown away when the machine gun was pointed away from the factory. And that was a big turning point. And at that point, when the military, the U.S. Army was sent to support striking workers, at that point, it was like, you know, a neon sign was put up in the sky that said, Go on strike, occupy their fact your factory, go on strike. And so all over the country, workers occupied their factories. In Flint, Michigan, they occupied their factories in, in um, West Virginia and in you know New York City, you had workers at uh, workers at department stores occupied their factories. It was this big moment where workers were sitting down. They were occupying their factories, seizing their means of production temporarily. Um, in order to demand union recognition. The CIO was the union that did it. Um, it was led by John L. Lewis of the Miners Union. Uh, and it was a big moment. Um, it was the moment that industrial unions were created. And it was during that moment that Roosevelt created unemployment insurance. So if you lost your job, you would pay in. And then if you lost your job, you could get unemployment insurance. And he also created social security. So when you reach a certain age, you get a social security pension. Um, and that's that was how we got social security. Roosevelt, um, you know, he was not willing to t move on on Jim Crow. Uh, his wife was. Eleanor Roosevelt was anti-racist. Eleanor Roosevelt invited black women to the White House. Eleanor Roosevelt made statements condemning Jim Crow segregation. But Franklin Roosevelt, he was a Democrat and the Democratic Party, the South, the Jim Crow South was a big part of the Democratic Party. Um, they used to call it the Solid South. And and Roosevelt was not going to move on Jim Crow. Right. And the Communist Party challenged him on this. Vito Marcantonio, who was the leader, uh, the member of Congress uh, in New York City, was aligned with the Communist Party. He vote he put up the anti lynching bill, uh, which, you know, just symbolically, Joe Biden just recently passed it. But back when, you know, lynchings were pretty regular and going on. Uh, you know, the anti-lynching bill would be put up by Vito Marcantonio and it would be unanimously voted down every time. Um, it was a big deal. And the Communist Party organized around the Scottsboro Nine, uh, nine African-American men that were falsely accused of rape and were going to get the death penalty. Uh, and they organized and eventually, you know, won freedom for the Scottsboro Nine. Um, a very famous case. Um, and uh so the Communist Party was demanding that they take action on the race, race front. Um, and, you know, the Democratic Party wasn't going to listen to them. Um, and World War II broke out. 
During World War II, the Communist Party did a very good job of equating the Ku Klux Klan and racism in the South with Nazis. And that was actually a very brilliant tactical maneuver in terms of propaganda. And it was brilliant. Um, and there were a lot of anti-racist propaganda films that were made by the U.S. government that were attacking that were attacking Nazism. But if you listen to them, they were subtly also attacking Jim Crow. And that was an amazing, if it weren't for the fact that the Communist Party had a lot of influence in Hollywood, Dalton Trumbo and and uh, and um, John Howard Lawson and and others. I mean, if it weren't for that, you wouldn't have had these amazing anti-racist films. But like, for example, um, you know, there was a song written by a communist called The House I Live In, um, you know, and, and uh, Frank Sinatra recorded a Hollywood you know, film of it, uh, basically. And it was it was, you know, opposing opposing racism, um, you know, and it's like it starts out. There's you know, it's this little short film and Frank Sinatra's in it. And, uh, you know, these kids are, you know, you know bullying another kid. And, and Frank Sinatra walks in and he says, hey, what are you kids doing there? And the one kid says, we don't approve of this other kid's religion. And so Frank Sinatra says to the little boy, why, you guys must be one of those Nazis I've been reading about. And they're like, no, we're not Nazis. And so then he sings them this song about why you shouldn't be racist, why being racist is un-American. Uh, Superman on the radio. Superman fought the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, on the radio, on the radio version of Superman, Superman would fight the KKK, um, you know, and they had people in the KKK who learned the KKK's actual secrets and leaked them on the radio. So all the actual secrets of the Klan were we. So it was, you know, they were able the popular front, you know, Roosevelt was fighting the Nazis, was aligned with the Soviet Union. Communists were able to get into the Roosevelt administration. They were able to do some good stuff in fighting racism during those years. But then after the war, McCarthyism came in and they purged you know, Roosevelt died, Truman came in and they just started purging anybody, anybody uh, in the Democratic Party or in, in the government who had anything good to say about communism in the Soviet Union. They just started purging them. Uh, they just started purging them left and right. Um, and, you know, among those who were purged uh, was, uh, you know, I mean, you know, Alger Hiss uh, was at the UN. They claimed he was secretly a Soviet agent, which is ridiculous. Um, and they went after anybody. Right. And so in response to that, Right. You know, the right wing got going and the right wing had this argument that any government intervention in the economy is communism. So that became like a central belief of the right wing is that they're opposed to a welfare state because a welfare state is communism. It's wealth redistribution. If you tax people to pay for social programs, that's somehow communism, which it's not. That's ridiculous. So, you know, the Democrats, they were known for being in favor of the welfare state. And there's a lot of low income white people in the South. And so, you know, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, when he came into office, right? You had Kennedy. Kennedy was assassinated. You had Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson was a racist. Uh, his nickname, they used to call him Lynching Baines Johnson. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was extremely racist. Um, and I've gone on on these lives about other aspects of his personality. Not a nice guy. But he was a big advocate of the welfare state. Um, and Lyndon Johnson, you know, he, he, he was, he had the great society. He called it the great society. He created Head Start, the Head Start program, which is for low income families. Uh, it's like daycare basically. Um, you know, he, you know, he, he took some moves to try and improve things for low income folks. Uh, there was a, a, a faction they called the state department socialists, and they were pro Vietnam war socialists, uh, who kind of worked with Lyndon Johnson. They were, anti-communist, um, anti-communist, pro-Vietnam War socialist, Michael Harrington. Uh, that's the guy who ended up founding DSA. He was a Schachtmanite Trotskyite, um, and he ended up working for the Lyndon Johnson administration. He wrote a book called The Other America, and he advised Lyndon Johnson on how to how to make uh, welfare programs. And and that seemed to be the role of, if, if you could, you could say you were a socialist, but as long as you supported the Vietnam War, as long as you supported the Bay and Big, uh, Pigs invasion, there were some like right-wing socialists in the Johnson administration. And so, you know, Lyndon Johnson, he, he passed the Civil Rights Act. A, a thing that happened before that that's certainly worth pointing out um, is that after World War II, Harry Truman was president. And, you know, Harry Truman was a racist. He was a member of the Ku Klux Klan at one point, briefly, until the KKK told him he couldn't hire Catholics to work in government jobs. So then he quit. You know, it's like he was OK with like the lynching and the killing black people and all of that. But it was when they told him he couldn't hire any Catholics in government jobs. He's like, I quit. You got to draw the line somewhere. You know, I mean, these things, I mean, it's, it's really unbelievable. Harry Truman, the guy who dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
um, you know, he, um, you know, he, he was president and Harry Truman wanted to create national health insurance. Um, after World War II, he said, basically, we ought to have a national health insurance program. Um, and it was going to go through, but the reason it didn't go through, um, the reason it didn't go through um, was because of racism. Basically, the South was told, you know, you know, we're, you know, we're not going to build two hospitals. You know, we're going to have the government. The government's going to build hospitals. There's going to be one hospital, not a black hospital and a white hospital. We're building two hospitals. And in the South, that didn't fly. And so the Southern Democrats, the Dixiecrats, moved away from national health insurance. And that was a big big moment, the fact that they moved away from it, right? That the Dixiecrats, they were against national health care because it meant integration. So fast forward, 1964, you know, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act are passed. Lyndon Johnson is president. The Vietnam War is going on. And, you know, in the next four or five years, the political crisis in the United States really escalated. Uh, you had, you know, after the, do the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, you had every major city in the United States had urban rebellions. The military was sent all over the country to put down urban rebellions in Detroit and in Washington, D.C. and in Boston and in New York, just urban rebellions. You had the Black Panther Party was growing. Uh, you had students on the college campuses protesting the Vietnam War. Columbia University shut down. Harvard shut down. You know, a lot of communist organizing among college students. So at that point, Richard Nixon came into office as this Bonapartist, this strong man who's going to end the political crisis. And Nixon came in, you know, and there was actually a three-way race that time. People don't realize this, but it was a three-way election. So it was Hubert Humphrey was running for the Democrats um, and Nixon was running for the Republicans. But then because the Democrats were basically a pro-civil rights party at that point, Hen uh, George Wallace, not Henry Wallace, totally different. George Wallace uh, from Alabama. George Wallace, the racist uh, white supremacist, he ran uh, for office on the American Independent Party ticket. And uh, so you had a three-way race with the American Independent Party of George Wallace running. And George Wallace, uh, you know, he was a third party candidate. He had no chance, but he was getting quite a bit of national play because he realized that, that a lot of average Americans hated hippies. A lot of average Americans hated hippies, and um, basically uh, he could use the hippie hating in order to make himself popular. And he actually reminds people a lot of Trump. His speeches were a lot like comedy routines. He would get up there and he would say, say the only four-letter word these young people protesting don't like is W-O-R-K and S-O-A-P. You know, and uh, what else would he say? He would say, you know, um, I don't know. Uh, you know, he'd say, five minutes after I take office, there will be no more red China. I will be the one to push the button. And, I mean, he was just this crazy right wing nut, but he was kind of rallying people that would be Democrats, right? Southern racists who were Democrats. He was rallying them around voting for him because they saw the Democrats as being the party of black people in the civil rights movement and the hippies. And Nixon noticed, Nixon's strategists noticed that that was a winning strategy. Well, we don't know exactly what happened, but, you know, George Wallace was shot. And after George Wallace was shot, um, at that point, Nixon started adopting all of George Wallace's rhetoric. Uh, Nixon started becoming the anti-hippie candidate. He said, I am the candidate of law and order, law and order. And uh, Nixon said, um, he, he said, you know, he said, you know, these people out in the streets are not romantic revolutionaries. Why, they're the same kind of common thugs that have always plagued the good people. You know, and Richard Nixon kind of became the anti-hippie anti and anti-civil rights president. And at that point, they realized that using economic issues, and this is the point, I think this is what the woman on the John Stewart show was saying. The agenda is austerity. The, it's about getting rid of the welfare state. It's about implementing free market libertarian policies. But the, the only way to get low income workers to vote for them is to make it about race. White low income workers are not going to vote to cut their own paychecks, their own food stamps, their own government jobs. But if you make it about race, they will. 
And it's a tragedy. It's a really big tragedy. But basically, the way to get all these low income Southern white workers and Midwestern white workers, low in, in, in order to get working class people around America to support austerity, the way to do it was to racialize it. For example, the term welfare mother. Now, if you think of a welfare mother, what image immediately pops into your mind? You think of an African American woman, even though the majority of women with children who receive government assistance are white. That is a fact, right? The majority of women with children who receive government assistance are white. However, when you hear welfare mother, you immediately think black woman. So if you go into working class neighborhoods, white working class neighborhoods, and you say, aren't you mad about the welfare mothers? They don't think of people in their neighborhood who, you know, the mother is low income and the children are, you know, and they immediately think of, black woman, someone who is from a different race, a different ethnicity, and appeals to their racism. And they're like, yeah, cut off the support to welfare mothers. It's it's disgusting. It's tragic. And it's awful. Um, you know, and that, you know, there's many examples of this, right? Um, you know, by making austerity and cutting back the welfare state, by making it about, not about cutting off people who look like you, but cutting off people of another race, you got white people to support it. And that's tragedy. And that shows how toxic racism really is. Um, and it also, it, it's it's sad because the propaganda around it was not true. You know, there's a, a, a documentary I watched years ago, and it was when Bill Clinton ended like so-called welfare as we know it, when he got rid of uh, uh, one of the big welfare programs that we had in the United States. They followed, they interviewed four women uh, with children who were going to lose their government assistance. And they interviewed one woman um, who was going to lose her government assistance. And she was an Appalachia, white woman. And she kept insisting that she supported getting rid of the program because of those black people. I mean, she didn't put it in those words, but in her mind, yeah, she actually needed assistance, but the black people don't. And everybody knows it, she said. Everybody knows the black people are just, you know, mooching off the system, blah, 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 blah. And like she was losing her own benefits. She's white, her children are white, and it's the same program that, that aids people of color. But in her mind, you know, this stereotype of, of black people are lazy, blah, 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 blah. And so based on that, she was supporting the government taking away her food assistance and her cash assistance. I mean, and it's a tragedy, right? And it shows how toxic racism really is. So the woman who's saying, saying that on John Stewart's program, she's right in a way that by using racism, they were able to push austerity. That's true. But but I guess I wouldn't frame it the way she frames it. I wouldn't frame it as Americans were in favor of a welfare state until segregation was gotten rid of. I wouldn't put it that way. What I would say is that racism and appealing to racism and and kind of stoking white backlash in response to the Civil Rights Act was a main way that the ruling class was able to push through austerity. That's how I would frame it up. I wouldn't frame it up that way because it's, again, it, you know, it wasn't like, you know, there was a welfare state all this time, there was a welfare state, and then suddenly they got rid of segregation and then there was no welfare state anymore. It's not like that at all. There was never really much of a welfare state in the United States until Roosevelt. And Roosevelt passed it, and racism was always a barrier to that welfare state. And then as a result of a huge episode of political and economic unrest and confusion in the country from 1968 to 1972, you had a resurgence of the right wing, and the right wing was using racism to push austerity. That's what happened. That's how I would frame it. I hope that that, that answers your question. It's a very long answer to a very complicated question. But I guess the, the reason that I, I even, you know, I, I assume the reason the person asked me about it, I assume, is because, um, you know, if you frame it that way, and this is, a, this is the problem with wokeism, if you frame it that way, it, the way that this person, I, I haven't listened to the podcast, but the way this person framed it, if you frame it that way, it makes it sound like there's no economic problem. The problem isn't capitalism. It's just Americans are racist and we need to just shout racist at Americans all day long. And if we just shout racist at Americans loud enough and we come out with the 1619 project to prove the whole reason the USA was created was just because of racism. And if we just shout racist, racist, racist at America, that'll solve the problem. And it won't, right? I mean, 
racism is built into the, the United States. That's true. And that, you know, we do obviously need to combat it and, and reinventing the United States. And, but it's rooted in the economic system. That is, that is the problem. The problem is rooted in the system of capitalism and imperialism. And that if you just, you know, if you just shout racist at it loud enough, it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't solve the problem. And the, the biggest, biggest way to defeat racism in U.S. history has always been the picket line. You know, I talked about the Flint sit-down strike earlier. Now, during the Flint sit-down strike, there was one black worker in the auto plant in Flint, Michigan. One at the Fisher Body Auto Plant. And when they marched out of the factory victorious after getting their union contract, they made a political statement by having the one black worker carry the American flag. And it was the, the Ku Klux Klan had tried to drive him out of the plant and they fought the Klan. And the, the Black Legion, another fascist group that allowed Catholics, so they wore black robes instead of white robes, the people who killed Malcolm X's father, they had attacked the plant and tried to drive them out of there. But, but when they won, there was only one black worker in the auto plant. And they made a point, a political statement of having him carry the American flag as they marched out victorious in 1937. And the CIO was an anti-racist union. Uh, you know, the American Federation of Labor was historically racist. But when the when the Communist Party and John L. Lewis broke with the AFL and they formed the CIO, the CIO was an anti-racist union. Um, and because the CIO was an anti-racist union, uh, they started winning victories. I talked earlier about in San Francisco, the San Francisco dock workers strike. The reason that that strike was victorious is because historically in San Francisco, there have been many dock workers strikes. You know, dock workers didn't get treated very well. They're low paid workers. And, you know, they had a humiliating, they called a straw boss system, you know, where you'd have to like beg for work basically. And, and all of this. And, and there would be a lot of dock workers strikes, but every time there was a dock workers strike, the black community would be used as scab labor. You know, they, they, they would stop hiring the white workers would go on strike and they start hiring the black people. The reason that the dock workers won in 1934, the reason that they won uh, was because because the Communist Party went to black churches and they had a lot of respect in the black community. And and the Communist Party made an agreement. They wrote an, a written agreement that if they won the strike, they would get a hiring hall. So the union hired people. It wasn't the bosses who hired them. It was a hiring hall. So the union hired people. And with their hiring hall, they would make sure that black workers got hired to work on the docks, that one of the demands of the strike was to make sure that black workers, black longshoremen got hired. And that was a game changer because when the black community found out that these longshoremen are on strike and one of their demands is to let black people work on the docks and to open up good paying union jobs on the docks to the black community, the black community supported the strike. They didn't oppose it. And it was overcoming racism. And it was what William Z. Foster had been talking about in the 1919 steel strike. When, when the unions get over racism and they start fighting, not just for the individual workers of an individual workplace, but as Karl Marx wrote, when the unions become vehicles to fight for the entire class, that's when they're victorious. And that's what happened in 1934. And they, they started becoming a vehicle. And, and the, the anti-racism uh, caused the labor movement to very, very significantly advance. Um, and uh, that happened in Flint, Michigan. And it happened in many places, right? That, uh, that bringing black and white workers together, putting the demands of the black community at the front is a way to elevate the entire working class. Um, you know, so, you know, I would disagree with the way that person phrased it, but there's a lot of truth in what they're saying that the, but they're, they're putting it the wrong way. It's not that the U S government was for a welfare state. We just had a huge welfare state. And then in 1964, we got desegregation and then there was no more welfare state. No, there's barely ever been a welfare state in the United States. And the main way that post 1968, the right wing began fighting against the welfare state was with racism by making it seem like. The only people who benefit from social programs are black people. When in reality, when in reality, the main, most of the beneficiaries of government social programs are white. Uh, but by making it sound like, you know, oh, you don't want your money to go, you know, go to black people, do you? That's basically what the right wing was saying. By appealing to racism, by playing up the idea that black people are criminal, that black people are lazy, all of that, by playing up that idea, they were able to push austerity. And that's why to be a revolutionary, you have to fight racism. 
racism is the biggest impediment to class struggle in this in, in this country, and it overwhelmingly has been. Um, but you know, again, if you frame it up that way, you're missing the point. It's a way of missing the point, point. Um, and that's what the wokeism is largely about. It's about kind of just trying to present the idea: well, America has always just been this evil, racist place, and we just shout racist at America, and we all just burn stuff down. That'll solve the problem. It's not understanding that there was a class struggle going on. And there has been a class struggle in this country since it was founded. And that racism is a tool of the bosses in that class struggle to hurt all workers. That's the point. That's the point.